Hey, YouTube. So last week, I got to introduce you to one of my nearest and dearest, a guy named Elliot Terrell, and he taught you guys one of his best card changes. I'll put a link up in the top if you want to check that out. But while he was going over how to do that card change, he lightly touched on a book that's actually had a pretty profound impact on not just me, but the magic world in general. It's a book called Card Control. It's written by a guy named Arthur Buckley. And the story of the author is just as impressive as the legacy of the books that he wrote. Let me tell you why. This is it. Card Control. Practical Methods and 40 Original Card Experiments by Arthur H. Buckley. This is the 1993 paperback edition printed by Dover. You can actually still buy this guy on Amazon for like 15 bucks. But this is my second copy. And beat to hell and dog-eared though this one may be, my original copy fell to pieces because I read it so often. The original edition of this book was printed back in 1946, just after the end of World War II by the Williamson Printing and Publishing Company. And this is when Arthur Buckley had largely retired from active performances. He still did things, but he wasn't on the road. It used to have a much more bombastic subtitle though, of a postgraduate course on practical methods supplemented by 40 original card experiments, which honestly is a lot more accurate because nothing about this book is easy. But the strangest part about this book is its size. This is a TARDIS. This is one of those weird things where it's bigger on the inside than it is on the outside. It's 220 pages. It is barely thick enough to level a crooked coffee table. And yet somehow Arthur was able to encapsulate in that meager number of pages entire eras of card magic, from hardcore in the hands card techniques to gambling slights to classic card manipulation, and still somehow was able to squeeze in 40 routine ideas. But even then he wasn't done because he did something that was still pretty difficult to do at the time. When this was printed in the 40s, magic books really only came in three flavors. The first were classic texts that had zero visual help. You just had to lean on the descriptive prowess of whoever wrote the book and hope that you could follow along. Then came the era of magic books where illustrators were hired or the authors themselves would do drawings to try to clarify what they were describing, like the positions of the hands and the fingers and the props. Sometimes the illustrations were done so well that it really did help clarify the situation. Sometimes the drawings were less than optimal, and it was honestly easier to just lean on the original descriptions. But because of the difficulty of the material that Arthur was trying to teach in this book, he made the decision that wherever it was relevant, he was going to use full-blown photographs. There's over 300 of them. And this book was released privately by Arthur. It wasn't sponsored by a magic company initially. So that meant that the cost of typesetting around photographs largely fell to him. And he did it anyway, because he obviously thought that clarity was worth the price. And honestly, Arthur Buckley is the only person I can think of who had enough talent and prowess to write a book that has this much going for it. When he first got started, he was kind of a wonder kid. Everything he touched in magic, he mastered and eventually became a recognized authority in. Cards, coins, general manipulation, mentalism, gambling slights, that's a fun story. What he didn't lack was talent. What he lacked was performance prowess. He didn't have the experience performing in front of real people. And even that he gained at breakneck speed but he did it in the hardest way I can possibly think of. Before we go much further, I want to teach you guys something that I learned from Buckley, from this book, Card Control. It's on page 76. It's a move called the throw change. This is what it looks like. Okay, so let's go over this. And I'm going to teach you the way that I just did it because it's slightly different than the way that Buckley describes. And Buckley doesn't give much detail. Essentially, he says that you need to catch a double where the top card is some relevant card. And then you need to shove your thumb underneath a break under a double, curl your fingers on the back, display the card as one, and then extend your fingers to throw that card out about six inches off the ground under someone's shoe, and then somehow inauspiciously get this either back into palm or back to the deck without seeming to hurry. But again, the description is that big, so it doesn't offer much detail. And there were a couple of things that I wasn't nuts about. I don't like the idea of displaying a card like this. I never display a card like that. So to me, that's already suspicious. The other thing is getting it back into palm because what you're doing is called a pinch palm. When you throw that out, you've got this here and your hand naturally makes the card point up at a 45 degree angle. To get that back into palm, you either need to press it against something 
or you have to do some pretty extravagant finger gymnastics to get it back into palm so you can get it back to the deck without causing any suspicion or having to hurry. So I made a couple of changes. The first thing that you wanna do is a double. And the one that you saw me do is I just set a double down on the table. And that's just because doubles don't scare me. I can do this all day and I'm not worried about them splitting. That just comes with practice, but you do not have to do it that way. What you could do is do a standard double the way that you normally do, pick up the short ends and then do that. Just push a little bit of the air out from between the cards and drop it straight down. And part of this is that you wanna be able to let go of the cards because it's more free and as such a little less suspicious. Then the next move is a little complex because you're doing two things at once. What I'm going to do is tilt this card up and get it back into the exact same position that Buckley had when he was doing it from the top of the deck. The only difference is I'm not doing it to display the card, I'm doing it to throw the card underneath an object. I don't have a foot, I just use this box right here. So what I do is I grab the card first because it's gonna take me a little time to put it into this crotch position. And I do that by grabbing at the corners here and tilting it up on my thumb so that way it doesn't split the double. And then I immediately put it into the crotch of my thumb. As I lift this up, that's when I do that throw. And all I'm going to do is peel this card back and I'm going to move my hand forward so that way the card, before it starts to fall, clears this card. So that way it doesn't get caught. I'm not throwing it and then it's stuck there floating against an invisible card and doing this weird slow fall thing. So I'm going to extend, I'm gonna lift up the box and throw that underneath. And now this is the nice part because it is in the same pinch palm. And if I let it go from against the table, I still have that same issue. It's sticking out 45 degrees from my hand. But now I've got the table pressing it against my hand. And from here, getting it into palm is pretty easy because all I have to do is apply a bit of pressure to that corner with my first finger and it bows up into my hand. This is actually an Ackerman palm. You could pick it up like that and that's an Ackerman, an Alan Ackerman style palm, but I don't do that style of palm. I just use that to bow it so that way when I lift up, I can catch it with the pinky and now I'm in no rush. I could talk, gesture, put it on top of the deck, lift up the box and then show that that card has changed. Ta-da! So Arthur Buckley is born in Queensland, Australia in 1890. This is the same area that Gene Hugart, the guy who wrote Expert Card Technique, is also from. Anyway, at age 17, he makes the proclamation that he has mastered all of magic and wants to become a professional. So he finagles his way onto a performance troupe that travels around Australia doing shows for large theaters. The year is now 1908, and a 17-year-old, very talented, but highly inexperienced Arthur Buckley steps up on stage to a packed house for his premiere performance, and he just stands there. He freezes. The stage manager actually has to close the curtain on him just to get him off stage. And the guy who gave him his shot, the guy who has him under contract, an American actor named Harry Salmon, has to teach Arthur from scratch how to perform in front of a live audience. But man, does Arthur learn. After 18 months of doing just that, Arthur Buckley is the headliner. There's a chapter in the middle of card control called Conjuring at the Card Table, and it's chock full of really difficult gambling sleight of hand which seems a bit odd because there's nothing about Arthur Buckley's history to suggest that he was a prodigious gambler. Incredible card man, but gambling sleight of hand and magic with cards are only adjacent to each other. They sure as hell are not the same thing. So where does that chapter come from? One of the things that explains it is probably the group of performers that Arthur found himself a part of in his late teens. This was his crash course in performing, but they were a traveling show, which meant that they were on the hook for renting the halls and theaters that they were going to be performing at, whether or not a performance was happening at any given time. So one of the ways that this group could recoup some of the cost is they would sublease out these halls and theaters to whoever was interested in using it whenever a performance wasn't going on. And one of the groups that was always interested was gambling outfits, people who wanted to run their card games out of big open spaces. So this group would allow them to do that on two conditions. One, they pay for its use. And two, they talk up the show that was coming into town, especially that talented young card man, Arthur Buckley. And this is it, this is where I think it happens when he starts to get involved in the gambling sleight of hand side of things. It makes sense. 
Arthur Buckley at this point is a highly motivated, very talented teenager who is absorbing as much knowledge as he can when he's not busy performing. Put that guy in a place that is effectively a card room when it's not busy being a theater, and he's likely going to try to pick up everything that he can. That, and by all accounts, he was one of the most generous spirits walking the face of the earth. People wanted to see him succeed. And it's that openness that I think allowed him to learn from people who would normally guard their secrets pretty tightly. It's funny because when he thanks all the people who contributed to his knowledge in that chapter, he uses an awful lot of first names, which you normally only do if you either don't know people or they're the type of people who don't want to be named publicly. But for all his prowess with cards and coins and manipulation and whatnot, eventually Arthur Buckley became most known for his mentalism act that he had with his wife Helena, who was his rock throughout his entire career. When he had the opportunity to tour the US for the first time, he did it with her, and that was the act that sold out theaters across the US from coast to coast. It was also the act that he brought home to Australia, and it was his bread and butter for a number of years. But it was also the type of act that got him into a lot of trouble. Eventually, he kept getting prosecuted for giving horoscopes, essentially being a charlatan. And though he won all of his cases, the legal bills were very expensive and not very rewarding. So he made two major changes to his life. The first is he stopped being a professional magician. He went back to being a very talented amateur. And number two, he moved to the US. Arthur lives out the last 19 years of his life in Chicago as a creative consulting electrical engineer, which sounds like a made-up profession, but he actually did that. And even though he wasn't a professional magician anymore, he still did everything in his power to give back to the art form that had been so good to him. So he writes three books, one on mentalism, one on manipulation, and one on card control. This book will be 75 years old this year, and even now is still one of the most respected and effective books on card magic ever written. So I hope you get the chance to check it out. Anyway, in the meantime, I'll see you guys soon.